G'day YouTube, 1MJ here and welcome back. Alright, aren't things looking pretty interesting at the moment? Market cap continuing to go up. Bitcoin struggling at that sort of $60,000, $61,000 level. But we are getting oh so close. I mean the lows are getting higher, you know, we're barely dropping into the 58,000s anymore. And we are at 60,000 here which is nice, but we just can't break that $61,000 mark at the moment. ETH is up. I mean, look, it's just a sea of green here at the moment. Things are looking pretty good. The IPO happens, well, it's the 13th of April here, so I think that's still sort of two days away because we're looking it over in the States. But that is, it's making the market frothy at the moment, that's for sure. I mean, gas is low. Have a look at Bitcoin dominance. It's dropped even more. Now we are down into the 52% range. Ethereum, 11%. This is Getting very interesting, ladies and gentlemen. Very, very interesting. It's going to be... I'm really waiting to see what happens if Bitcoin breaks the $61,000, $62,000 barrier. Does all of a sudden all this money that's being put into altcoins just simply come out and pour back into Bitcoin? And do we see Bitcoin's dominance really start to rise again? Or is this just simply now the market all sort of moves in tandem where everything can sort of pump relatively at the same time there's going to be some things that are pumping while some things are dumping but is it going to be that kind of jumping back and forth sort of thing that goes on and that's what we saw at the end of the bull run back in 2017 everything was sort of pumping together generally it'd be bitcoin uh, and a couple of other things would pump one day then they would sell off a little bit and everything else would be pumping and it'd just keep jumping back and forth between some of the big caps uh, and, and then everything else, particularly in the top 100. I wasn't playing too much outside of the top 100 last time. It was all in the top 100 and I'm still doing very similar now. But that's what I'm looking for. Is it going to be sort of, you know, Bitcoin pumps one day, then everything else the next, and then Bitcoin the next day after that, and then everything else the day after that? That is what I'm looking for. But if Bitcoin does get on a bit of a run and, you know, pumps up to 70, 80,000 or something like that, maybe all this altcoin gains just simply jumps back into Bitcoin and this really starts to rise. We'll have to wait and see. But I mean, have a look at this. $2.14 trillion, nice. So we're growing slowly but surely. And again, the dominance of Bitcoin just dropping. And look, even the Bitcoin, even the Ethereum dominance is dropping. So that's very, very interesting. All right, let's have a look. What's really pumped in the last 24 hours? What's done well? Because it looks like a sea of green here at the moment. I mean, Uniswap, I'm going to say, that's going to have to be up there. Binance coin, wow. Kicking myself that I sold that coin. All right, yep, there we go. Uniswap up the top. Chili's making another move. Maker's back. Sushi, Binance, Flow, Stacks, Anchor, Thor, Nexo, Aave. Oh, nice. Aave coming out of the doldrums. But we'll have to wait and see whether that holds or not. So, look, some really good gains there. And, again, 15% or more in 24 hours is good in my book. So, the green is all looking very good. What about the red? Has there been any coins that haven't fared so well in the last 24 hours? Not really. I mean, there's been some coins that, you know, have obviously lost, but they haven't really been hammered. I mean, 6.2%, not too bad. VeChain, you know, down 9%. Obviously, it was up nearly 40% there, so that's to be expected. You know, no sort of 10% or more. They're all under. Filecoin uh, has come down again. So for me, uh, that's something that I'm looking into. Yes, we got a little bit of a bounce here in the last hour, but we looked at those the other day, and I'll have to have a look. And I forgot we're going to have a look at XRP. Uh, I can type that in and we'll have a look. But look, the gains are pretty good there. The, the losses at the moment, not really too bad. Let's go over here. We'll actually have a look at XRP. We'll do it now. So XRP to Bitcoin. No, the system wants to... No, there we go. XRP to Bitcoin, Binance. Let's see how it's doing. So we looked at this the other day. Or was that to the dollar maybe? I think I had... No, this, this is the right chart. So there we go. All right, we'll bring this down a little bit. We can see 
that this actually is sort of over that line at the moment. So it does look like it might be using, using it as support, but we can see it's already had a bit of a sell off, but it does seem to be holding and it's holding at old support. So XRP, I might have to look into getting some XRP because it is holding above this kind of base that it formed for a really, really long time. We can see this base from back in sort of 2019 has sort of really held for a while. It's even bounced off it, became a bit of resistance, and then we've been under there for quite some time. So XRP at the moment looks like it's holding. So yeah, I might have to be looking to get back into XRP. Let's move on from XRP though. Again, I, I wanted to, you know, show a little bit more support there than just, you know, really one or two bars, but that's a good start. All right, here's Bitcoin. We can see this is that kind of bigger ascending wedge and we break out and we're just sitting on the trend line at the moment. Bitcoin is still, you know, it's just unsure of where it's gonna go at the moment. And I get the feeling like it might be waiting for the Coinbase IPO. There's a lot of other people talking about that as well. Could be completely wrong. That is a distinct possibility. But it seems to be just holding there. The volatility is very, very low at the moment. Like I said, the volatility really since, not so much back here, we had that steep sell off, but since definitely excuse me, sort of here, so back since the 13th of March, it's just been getting less, you know, not a lot of volatility, not a volatility, and it's very small, and now we're just waiting to see, is this going to be that big push, you know, up into the 70s that people are expecting, even getting towards the 80s, or is it more sideways or, you know, even worse, which some people are suspecting, Guggenheim, we saw that story yesterday, that maybe we have a dump, we're coming back down into the 50s before we can make a next leg up. Very, very interesting. I think it's going to be to the upside, but I've been wrong before and I'll be wrong again. So never take any, never take anything I say as financial advice, just someone's opinion who's been around for a little while though and likes to think that they may know a thing or two. But again, that doesn't mean I won't be proven wrong. Even the best of them gets proven wrong at times. All right, some interesting stories let's move on to. So we spoke about this, oh, this was months ago now that uh, banks over in Thailand, they were looking at getting involved in DeFi. Well, it seems it's intensifying. So I'm going to butcher this name, but hopefully I say it right. Cash Corn Bank. Yeah, hopefully I said that right. So Cash Corn Bank has identified asset-backed DeFi as having the potential to create economic value for Thailand. So basically what this goes on to say is they're looking uh, at parts of DeFi to start invigorating their country's finances and things like that. You know, the regular banking systems, you know, they're all just crippled at the moment. You know, very low interest rates and all that kind of stuff. But DeFi doesn't have that problem at the moment. So it looks like Thai banks are stepping up their their uh, their involvement in the DeFi space and looking to really get involved in that and to, again, stimulate and invigorate their country's finances and things like that. So interesting for Thai, uh, for the Thai banks, you know, how they're going to work the regulations around that and things like that. But there's always going to be someone that does it first. And it's not always going to be one of the, you know, big traditional banks that everyone thinks of, you know, JP Morgan and all the rest of it. It's probably going to be some smaller sort of nation. Uh, and Thailand's not the biggest nation in the world. It's not the smallest either. But they might jump first. And if it works for them, all of a sudden, you know, someone else will go, you know what, I'm probably going to give this a go. And it'll be some other small nation as well that'll probably have a go. And then all of a sudden, these small nations will start to become, you know, extremely financially advantageous. And you just watch all these other banks follow. It's same as governments. We're waiting for a government to come out and say, we've taken on Bitcoin, you know, as part of our reserve assets and all the rest of it. And then there'll be another government. And then there'll be another government. And then there'll be countries. And that's when it all really starts to take off. That's what we're waiting for. So we'll keep an eye on this and see how this Thai uh, bank does. Now, more Bitcoin ETFs. So Digital Galaxy, or Galaxy Digital, I should say. <laughs> I said that backwards. So the financial service services firm led by Michael Novogratz, or Mike Novogratz as most people know him, is the latest entity to file with the SEC for a Bitcoin ETF. Now, we did read the other day that they're saying it could still take two years for a Bitcoin ETF, which is interesting. That's, uh, you know, certainly going to be behind the eight ball for the American Bitcoin ETFs. Oh, excuse me. 
The number of companies filing to receive approval to launch a Bitcoin ETF in the US continues to increase with the addition of Mike Novogratz's Galaxy Digital. If approved, the Galaxy Digital, the, sorry, the Galaxy Bitcoin ETF will trade on the New York Stock Exchange, uh, ARCA Exchange. So every man and his dog's basically putting in for it, but look, they've done this before uh, and they've all been knocked back. I think the first one that was put in a while ago, and I can't remember who it was, Valkyrie or Van Eck or someone like that, I think they've got to April 29th to hear back. They have to have heard something. But on the 29th of April, they could just hear that it's been extended for a longer period. But either way, I think it's April 29th. The first one has to get some indication of sort of what's happening. So that's not too far away, you know, about two weeks away. And we should hear, you know, what's happening with the first one that was applied. And again, I think it was uh, Valkyrie or Van Eck, something like that, placed it. And, you know, more of following suit. So, yeah, watch this space. Joe Biden. So he's asked for some more money to be put into FinCEN and it's to combat illegal finances. So it's really stepping up KYC and all the rest of it, which again, I'm, I'm not completely opposed to, just as long as they don't, you know, sort of over-regulate it. So according to a discretionary budget request from President Biden, the budget increase would allocate $191 million to FinCEN. That's $64 million above its original 2021 budget, enabling the Bureau to close the loopholes in financial reporting requirements that enable illicit actors to evade scrutiny and mask their dealings. See, I'm all right with this. I don't have problems with that. As you know, I, I think we should, you know, we shouldn't be worried about people knowing what we're doing with our money. If it's completely legit and legal, then so be it. I think, you know, the whole blockchain space and there's a public ledger and we can all see what everyone else is doing. Yeah, I'm good with that because that way we know if there's any bad players and, you know, if there are bad players, they, they should be punished, plain and simple. And I know a lot of big business are even sort of worried about this. And I guess my next worry is that big business don't uh, face the same kind of, scrutiny that you know the average sort of investor will that won't be uh kosher i don't think i think you know the same rules for the big players need to play apply to the little players now, everything needs to be public and out there and everyone can see exactly what's going on uh, and that way if there are any bad players and anyone doing dodgy stuff even big business banks and you know governments and all the rest of it then it can be seen uh, and they could be held accountable for that, just like, you know, regular people would be because there's definitely a double standard system out there. You know, big business, they get away with, you know, laundering money for terrorists and all sorts of stuff. And if the little guy were to do that, you know, we'd be in jail for so long, it wouldn't be funny. Yet these big companies, you know, they just get fines and they pretend like it was an accident and they didn't know about it. And then all of a sudden they put these, you know, uh, things out saying oh you know we're looking into this and to make sure that this you know kind of thing never happens again and these accidents don't occur and it was never an accident they knew exactly what they were doing they just didn't care because it was worth so much money to them they probably made you know a couple of billion dollars and they paid you know a couple of hundred million dollars in a fine so it was worth them it's like yeah we're going to lose some of this money in a fine when we get caught but that's that's you know it's not going to stop them they'll continue to do it whereas if you or i were to do it you know we'd go to jail for you know 10 20 years or something like that and all our assets would be seized off us there is a total double standard for the way these things work and so we need the blockchain a public ledger everything is there everyone can see it and then there can't be any questions of you know whether someone's doing it or not it'll be there and then it's just about the the law, I guess, catching up and saying, all right, well, you know, we can't have one set of laws for big business and another set of laws for, you know, normal people. They've got basically got to be the same kind of laws. All right. Tesla, I mean, not Tesla, Time Magazine. They are now getting into Bitcoin. So Time Magazine will now be receiving some payments in Bitcoin. This is according to the Grayscale CEO, Michael Sonnen Sonnenheim. Hopefully I said that right. Now, it won't immediately be converting that crypto to fiat either. So this is very, very interesting. Grayscale is partnering with Time on a new video series uh, coming this summer explaining the crypto space. So again, this is, you know, they're going to push that out to the public and try and get the public on board. This is that, you know, mass adoption happening. Again, still very slowly, 
but it is happening. You know, you go back a couple of years, you would not have seen anything like this. And it's just another big company saying, yep, we're happy to, you know, take uh, some payments in Bitcoin. Now, again, not too many people are going to pay in Bitcoin in all fairness. They're simply not. But, you know, this is that, this is the start for them just getting their foot in the door there'll be a couple of people that'll pay a few things here and there in bitcoin some will most won't but once they kind of get on board and again the first bear market is what's really gonna you know decide how far they go into it because the good thing is they won't have a whole lot of skin in the game they will have some and they're going to watch that and see you know how much does it dip from you know whatever price they got it at and then how long does it take to recover and you know whether they can get through that next bear market i think a lot of big companies that are kind of tinkering in the space they'll do things like this and they'll hold a very small amount of bitcoin and they'll watch it go from let's say you know two hundred and eighty eight thousand dollars maybe down to you know forty thirty thousand dollars again something like that and then go back up to whatever crazy prices it does and if they can hold through that then they'll probably go you know what yeah we have to go through some bear markets that can be pretty rough although i don't think you know if we get to two hundred and eighty-eight thousand, i'm not sure bitcoin's going to come back down to twenty thirty thousand i think you know we'd probably be looking at more maybe the fifty thousand dollar mark but we'll wait and see but anyway once they get through that they'll probably understand that yeah the bear markets are brutal but they're getting less and less they'll have done their research but the upside is just so massive and then they'll probably start to make bigger plays in it that's really what i do think is coming So it says, equally as important, uh, Keith Grossman and Time has agreed to be paid in Bitcoin and will hold BTC on their balance sheets. This is just the start. They they haven't, you know, been convinced enough to invest too much into Bitcoin, but they are now open to receiving payments in Bitcoin and they're going to hold the Bitcoin on their balance sheet. That's their way of getting into it. Uh, And it'll be a very small start. And so again... We may not see the full mass crazy adoption this cycle. I really think we probably won't unless we're going into a super cycle that just, you know, kind of lasts for five or six years or maybe even a decade, you know, similar to the stocks that we have now. I think there'll be companies that will hold just a little bit of BTC like this and they're going to experiment with it over, you know, they'll probably sell a little bit and they'll probably hold a little bit and then they'll just sort of experience the downsides and then the upsides in the following cycles to come before they really jump in. So again, I I do think that we've got another cycle at least, unless, again, this turns into that super cycle, then that negates what I'm kind of saying now. But I think we've probably still got another cycle to go. I think we'll go through a fairly brutal bear market. I think it'll be a 50 to 60% correction as opposed to the you know 80, 90% corrections we've seen in the past. They're getting less. The upside is getting less and the downside is getting less. It's starting to somewhat stabilize, but I still think we probably have another cycle uh, where things will be quite lucrative for people who can get in at the right time and things like that. That's my opinion. It's never financial advice, though. All right, I was going to get uh, start building a new computer the other week and the one thing that was nearly impossible to get was graphics cards. So graphics card producer uh, NVIDIA said Q1 revenue is tracking above the 5.3 billion it forecasted in February, partly on better than expected sales of processors amid the cryptocurrency mining market. Shares of uh, NVIDIA rose 5% to $608 in the hours after trading. So yeah, trying to get a hold of a GP, uh, a GPU at the moment can be quite difficult. It's not that there's none out there, but they are very, very limited. There's all these waiting lists and things that uh, you have to go on at the moment. So great for Nvidia and shows how big mining is going to get. But you know, for people who want to simply buy a computer at the moment, this is hard to get, and you got to get on eBay and pay exorbitant prices for a lot of them out there at the moment and that really does suck but they did say that they were going to start making different gpus one specific to mining and then one specific to gaming but look if the mining ones run out they'll just buy the gaming ones because in the end they'll still do a fairly similar kind of job so yeah sucky if you're trying to buy a computer at the moment but look for the cryptocurrency space things couldn't be better could they All right, this is very, very interesting. So Binance, they are now going to allow users to trade tokenized stock tokens, starting with Tesla. 
So the cryptocurrency exchange Binance is allowing its users to buy fractions of company shares with a new tokenized stocks trading uh, service, starting with Tesla. So I think Robin Hood do something similar like this. You don't have to buy the whole share. You can buy, you know, micro shares in it. And now Binance, excuse me, are getting on board and, you know, their coin is just pumping. It's going so crazy. If they do something like... Uh, the Coinbase IPO, I mean, that'll be very, very interesting. Now, it's not the first tokenized stock play in the crypto land, though, because Terra Labs Mirror Protocol, they went live in December. They're doing something similar. But where Mirror uses synthetic stocks or tokenized representations of actual uh, equities, the Binance product is backed by a depository portfolio of underlying securities managed by, managed by an investment firm in Germany. So you are actually buying something that's actually... It, you're buying part of the stock. Uh, you're not just buying a synthetic asset, which uh, you know other th platforms have used. And look, I don't have a problem with synthetic assets as long as they're you know uh, mirroring the real thing. But you just got to remember that you don't actually own an asset. Uh, don't own the actual asset. You own uh, representation of that asset when you do synthetic stocks. So uh, again, there's upsides and downsides uh, to both. Generally, owning the actual thing is better. But again, you know, if a stock costs six hundred and something dollars, uh, and you don't have six hundred dollars, then you know it's very hard to buy that. Whereas buying synthetics, you know, you can buy bits and pieces of. But again, I think Robin Hood out uh, also does something similar. You can buy micro shares into stocks and things like that, and they are backed by the real thing. So very, very interesting. Now, here's something even more interesting: the rapper Nas. Apparently, he invested in Coinbase uh, quite some time ago, and it looks like it's going to pay off for him. So U.S. rapper, rapper Nasir Jones, or better known as Nas, is among the fortunate few to have made early investments in Coinbase. Now, Jones' investment firm, Queensbridge, Queensbridge Venture Partners, got into Coinbase's Series B round back in 2013 when it raised $25 million. Around the time, Coinbase was valued at $143 million. All right, now Queensbridge, which is also a backer of Robin Hood back in 2013. All right, so Queensbridge, they must be doing extremely well, and I think NAS is probably doing extremely well. Uh, and they also, later into Lyft and Dropbox, makes early stage investments between $100,000 and $500,000, according to Jones Queensbridge co-founder, Anthony Saylor. Now, if Coinbase trades at an investment bank uh, DA division's price of around $440, Queensbridge could see the value of, that they invested. So somewhere between 100000 and half a million, uh, their stake could rise to $43.7 million and to possibly $218.5 million, depending on how much they invested. So that is quite uh, an impressive gain, you know. A hundred thousand to half a million dollars, turning that into forty-three point seven million to possibly two hundred and eighteen point five million. Wow, unbelievable kind of gains. You know, people talking about ten xing and twenty xing and hundred xing. I mean, <laughs> that's what's happening right here. So extremely well done by Nas. And yeah, I didn't know he had been. Uh, one of the early investors into Coinbase, there's been a few people, I can't even remember the other ones, but uh, we've reported that in stories that, you know, some kind of well-known people, you know, rappers and movie stars and sports stars and things like that seem to have been early investors in Coinbase. Uh, and again, back in 2013, I mean, that is, that's early. I wonder if, you know, Nas was into crypto back then or he was just simply invested you know, into things like Coinbase back then. But either way, it sounds like it's going to pay off extremely well for them. So, yeah, congratulations to them. All right, again, really what I'm looking for, you know, two days' time still, uh, you know, is the Coinbase IPO going to be the thing to kick it off? I mean, it's Tuesday here. It's still early in the week, so that's still sort of Monday. Uh, you know, we've got a bit of a red candle here, though. There's been a bit of a sell-off, and it's just holding on that trend line at the moment. Are we going to have that big leg up that a lot of people are expecting? And that's what worries me a little bit. A lot of people are expecting it. Or is the market going to say, hey, this is why 
you don't get too cocky and think you know what's going to happen and boom we drop back down into here before we can start to make a next leg up i mean you know we'll have a look tomorrow and we'll see where the moving averages currently are at the moment the 50 the 100 the 200 and we'll even have a look at the 21 week exponential moving average and kind of see where everything's at but all right that's it from me stay safe be kind to one another hopefully you're on that gain train at the moment the market's still moving up so that's really really good and i'll see you next time